Okay, gang, let's roll. Welcome to Analyzing the Universe. To start with, I want to talk to you about images. Why? What's the big deal? We know all about them, right? After all, our lives are inundated with images. Images to cajole us into buying something. Images to remind us of an event or a person. Images to please our artistic tastes. But we take them for granted. Even our phones can now function as cameras. It is hard to imagine that a time even existed when we weren't besieged with photographs. Yet it is only around 1840 when people were astonished to find that they could now capture a moment in time in the minutest detail, far surpassing any method that had ever come before. A revolution ensued that is still in progress today. The mirror with a memory is what the early daguerreotypes were called. And since photographic images of one form or another constitute almost the sole means of analyzing astronomical objects, it behooves us to understand exactly what is involved in obtaining these images, how we perceive them, and what they can tell us. This is what we will be exploring in our first few lectures. The earliest photographs of an astronomical object were naturally of the moon. This image dates from 1851, taken by John Adams Whipple. Although Daguerre apparently took one in 1839, his laboratory and its contents sadly burned to the ground soon thereafter. What a loss! But some of the early photos of the 19th century were distinctly eerie. Just look at this street scene taken by Daguerre in 1838 of the Boulevard du Temple, a street always teeming with people and horse-drawn carriages in Paris. Yet no one is to be seen except for a tiny figure at the left who is getting his shoes shined, and thus was motionless for long enough to have his image appear on the photographic plate. Every other moving object could not register on it. Thus began a quest, still with us today, for speed, speed, and more speed, so that we can capture progressively shorter and shorter time intervals. We want our cameras, our telescopes, and even our iPhones to be more and more sensitive to light. When they do become more sensitive, we can acquire an image in less time, and we say that we have increased the temporal resolution of our observation. Today we can capture in one ten thousandth of a second what took Daguerre hours to register on his camera. What is more, we can record not only the day that an observation or photograph is taken, but using sophisticated electronics, we can time tag each individual packet of light as it is received into our instruments. We call these packets of light photons, and these photons are almost the exclusive providers of all of our astronomical data. So the first characteristic of our image description is our ability to record the time of arrival of light. This allows us to see whether the object we are looking at is changing its intensity or light output as a function of time. In other words, we can search for time variability of cosmic sources. But in addition to the timestamp and exposure sensitivity of film or digital detectors, each individual light gathering instrument, whether it be your eyes, a camera lens, or a huge satellite driven telescope, has an inherent spatial resolution as well, which is characterized by its ability to distinguish nearby regions from each other. Just imagine you are looking at an automobile approaching at night. From far away, first the headlights appear together on top of one another. You can't really tell that there are two of them. However, if you look through a pair of binoculars, you can easily distinguish them. 
We can see how this ability to see parts of an object can change quite dramatically by comparing two observations of Cas A, an X-ray emitting supernova remnant whose light first reached the Earth about 300 years ago. We will have more to say about this object in coming weeks, but for now, I just want you to examine two images of this object, one taken about 20 years ago with the Rentgen satellite, or ROSAT for short, and the other from NASA's Chandra satellite less than five years later. The difference is positively breathtaking. Things change quickly in the world of X-ray astrophysics. These two images barely look like the same object, but we know they are the same since we are pointing our satellites at the same point in space. Here is another pair of images of the Crab Nebula from the same two satellites. You can see that with better spatial resolution, we have an increased ability to examine individual parts of an object and compare those regions with one another. And this spatial resolution is a function of several aspects of our instrument, among which is its diameter. The bigger the better. Indeed, improved resolution is a primary reason why we make bigger and bigger telescopes. It is not as is usually thought because we want to magnify things more. So now we have our second bit of imaging information, namely the spatial position that each photon came from. What else can images tell us? Let's look at these two photographs of the Flatiron Building, the first skyscraper ever built in New York City in 1902. What is the obvious difference between these two images? Right, one is in color, the other in black and white. In one, we have energy information. For example, blue light is more energetic than red light. X-rays are more energetic than blue light. You might say then, why bother with the black and white image at all? Aside from artistic considerations though, Black and white representations of objects can be more useful than color ones at times. Consider, for example, the red facade on the left-hand side of the image across the street from the Flatiron Building. Is it brighter than the adjacent sky area? Since our eyes respond differently to blue and red light, the answer is not obvious. But we can get the answer with the black and white rendition. There, you can clearly see that it is darker than the surrounding sky. This will be important when we consider X-ray images in detail. After all, our eyes can't see X-rays at all. We are not supermen or women. Therefore, any representation of an X-ray source is going to be a bit problematical, and we will discuss this at length shortly. So the third clue that our astronomical images can provide is the energy of each photon, as well as how many photons of each energy gets emitted each second. We will see that this so-called energy spectrum becomes a vital fingerprint for understanding the chemical composition of astronomical objects as well as giving us insight into the energy production mechanisms governing their radiation. Just as fluorescent lamps work differently from ordinary so-called tungsten light bulbs, so do cosmic sources have different ways to produce their energy. So, the energy spectrum can tell us what the object is made of and how it produces its light. And that's it. All we can glean from the tiny pinpoints of light coming from distant objects scattered about in the universe are these three bits of data encoded into each photon. And from these data, we can construct models to understand the incredibly diverse inhabitants of the cosmos. The fact that we can do this at all is simply astonishing. And it certainly becomes an exciting and interesting process to undertake. So now let's move on and get a good look at an image, up close and personal. 
What you see mounted on this tripod is a true work of art. It is a handcrafted camera made entirely by hand by Ron Wisner in Massachusetts called a Wisner Technical Field Camera. This is one of the earliest ones he ever made. If we zoom in, you might be able to see the serial number in the lower right-hand corner, number 257. What you see here on top, where my finger is pointing, is the ground glass, and that's where the image will get formed that you can see with your eyes, and then if you're using it as you would a regular camera, you put in a piece of sheet film and take your photograph that way. But you'll see lots of knobs and all sorts of adjusting things that can be utilized to do various perspective control items. Okay, here's the camera set up. All of these controls here allow you to raise and lower or shift one way or another the lens relative to the film. You know how you always take a photograph of a building and in order to get the whole building in the field of view, you tip your camera back and that makes the building lean over, looks like it's falling over? Well, with this camera, all you have to do is raise up the front of the lens and that will never happen. Perspective control is a vital reason why view cameras have remained popular up to the present day. Okay, this is the place where you can actually view your image. What normally you would do when you use this camera is you would close your shutter and then this film holder contains two sheets of film and it's behind this dark slide so it doesn't get exposed. You simply put the sheet film holder in now you can set up your camera after you focus to give you the right exposure and pull your dark slide, take your photograph, put the dark slide back in, take out your film holder. We're not going to do that, but that's the procedure. What we are going to do, though, is try to see what the image looks like. Hi gang, how's it going? What do you see in the image that is presented on your computer screen that is so unusual? This is actually the way that all images are formed, even the image of anything that you look with your eyes. So what is going on here?